So a very warm welcome to our distinguished panelists. It's an absolute pleasure in moderating this uh, webinar on recipe for change. As you know, the pandemic has been a complete uh, shocker and the food and beverage industry was disrupted due to this crisis and uh, restorers and cafe owners have leveraged on creativity to staying afloat in the market. Interestingly, we have five personalities sharing their perspectives today on how they navigated during this, these challenging times and the future outlook of the industry. Uh, so firstly, uh, a big shout out to our supporting partners, Eat Me Global, Celeste and Harpo's for organize, organizing this much anticipated webinar. Uh, before we commence, there are a few ground rules for our audience. Uh, for questions, uh, please post questions in the comment section and it shall be read out to the panelists. If your question has already been answered during discussion, kindly refrain from reposting the same question again. Uh, to our panelists, I shall be reading out the questions and giving the opportunity to each panelist to share their own perspective. There will be general questions directed to have the perspective of all five panelists and simultaneously more specific industry business related questions directed to each one of you. A time slot of five minutes will be allocated for answering each question. Appreciate your kind cooperation towards the adherence of time. So introducing our distinguished panelist, Mr. Jude Kumar, founder, CEO, Eat Me Global. Good evening, Jude. Thank you for joining this webinar. Yep, nice to be here. Great. Ms. Ronali Pereira, Founder, Director, Refreshing Ayurvedic Wellness, also known as Raw Sri Lanka. Good evening, uh, Ronali. Thank you for joining this webinar. Yeah. Mr. Dilupa Patirana, General Manager, Barista Sri Lanka. Good evening, Dilupa. Thank you for joining this webinar. Hi. Thank you. Good evening. Ms. Melissa Dharmadasa, Founder, Big Spy Bella. Good evening, Melissa. Thank you for joining this webinar. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Great. Pleasure. Uh, and last but not least, Mr. Janik Jayasurya, founder Celeste and Escape Diaries. Good evening, Janik. Thank you for joining this webinar. Right. So it looks as if Janik has still not joined the webinar. Let's hope he tunes in soon. Uh, so let's uh, dive in. Uh, uh, let's dive straight into the questions. Uh, uh, so I, my first question, I'd like to direct it to all panelists. Uh, COVID-19 was unprecedented in nature that has had global implications that no one absolutely imagined. How has the transition been from the start of lockdown to now when it comes to your business? I'd like to start with uh, Jude. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, before lockdown, we, we were a dining app. Uh, we were focusing on giving discounts to, uh, you know, for, for customers to walk into the restaurant. Uh, we were focusing on gathering content by giving them um, a cash points in return for their pictures, for the photos of the dishes. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do was to try and get uh, people to spend more for dine-in. Now, uh, we launched this product uh, one month prior to COVID. Uh, that means uh, close towards the end of that. And um, as soon as, uh, you know, as soon as COVID happened, uh, we actually completely changed the entire product to become a, a, a grocery store plus a food delivery app. Uh, we actually never had planned to go into food delivery at, at the start, but uh, we ended up getting there. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we, we basically adapted really fast. We built a product within five days. And um, I think it took us another five or maximum 10 days to get it fully operational. And we finished about, I think, 4,000 deliveries for groceries during COVID. And then we started the food delivery operation uh, right after. So I think for us, it's been totally different, completely uh, uh, a pivot. Thank you, Jude, for sharing your uh, comments. Uh, Ronali? Um, so the the funny thing is i actually had a lot of orders during lockdown but sadly since it was locked down i had no way of getting it across to the customers because i managed to uh, i made a call um, that i'm not going to operate until things kind of subsided a bit because both my parents are over the age of 60 and i didn't want to take a risk of people coming to my house my staff 
coming to my house i don't know who they've been in contact with and exposing my parents to that risk because they fall under the vulnerable category um so for two months yeah for two months total shut down um and then i got, uh, uh, a, a pass to, to start operating on the 5th of may uh, but the problem is all the uh, i rely on my farmers to send the produce to me to make the juices right? and they didn't get the pass so the produce was stuck in the farms out of colombo with no way to get to me to make the juices so um that was kind of a dilemma so just um managed until that situation was kind of averted and then um got back into it um uh, and I've, i've seen an increase in demand for the juices um i guess people realize that it's really important to to make sure that you're eating healthy and keeping your immune system in check um especially during these unprecedented times the the attention has gone back to your body and how important it is to stay um so yeah two months it was nothing i could do to uh, solve the problem because i depend on the farmers sending me the um uh, but yeah it's coming back to normal now. yeah that's good to hear i mean the, yes uh, it has been challenging times i i do agree uh, dilupa your thoughts well uh, we were operating about uh, almost 10 um, cafes around sri lanka and when the lockdown happened on the 21st of march it was just a standstill people couldn't come out and our operations were like back to zero so we went 3 days with zero revenue uh and then we started our own distribution because at that time our only delivery partner was uber we were exclusively with uber uh they couldn't get their operation um on the ground so we had to start our own operations of deliveries just like within 3 days uh, and that was uh, with a discussion i mean it was a discussion about a 2 year discussion of having our own <laughs> delivery arm uh, for the cafe but we had to get it done within 3 days and we were up and running after 3 days so during the that extreme lockdown we were only about 15% of what we were but you know now the people have the freedom to come out and we are back into i would say about 70% of the outlet which is open because i have some outlets that are not still open for an example bia bandar naik international airport outlet is closed that was about a 30% of my revenue like if on a normal day so that 30% will be still uh, not uh, coming to the business but the rest of the outlets are i would say about 70 to 75% all right and the flagship outlet that we have in colombo wood place the caramel farm thing that's about 85 to 90% so things are getting better Dear Dilupa, thank you for sharing uh, that. Uh, thank you for sharing your feedback, uh, Melissa. Yes, so I have to agree with Dilupa. Um, you you were lucky that you started in three days. Um, it took me until maybe the first of April when I managed to secure my passes. So for a good, I would say, week and a half almost. I was pulling the hairs out of my head trying to figure out how I was going to pay my rent, um uh, my staff salaries and you know my suppliers, you know, all of it. Um managed to secure the uh, passes for a limited number of staff and we commenced uh our uh, uh a, a distress menu of sorts of stuff that I was particularly craving during the lockdown and that was mainly chocolate and um weirdly enough bread. So that was what we started with um the moment we opened and I must say like my breads became such a fast seller during that time that it was quite insane and another thing that really sustained me during that time was I mean lockdown or not people still had their um birthdays to celebrate so I had that as a contingency that or I was able to fall back on um in terms of giving us some sort of revenue during that time which really you know helped on the long run and uh, just like the looper said we had to 
um, I wasn't uh, on Uber Eats and I was just getting on Pick Me uh, at that time as well. So we had to kind of resort to our own in-house deliveries. And I must say that did work better for us because people were concerned and worried in terms of hygiene and, you know, all of that. So it coming from our own in-house team, people were more comfortable to order directly through us rather than through um, the app, which was awesome. Um, and I actually encouraged that. That was brilliant. Now that we've, now it's, well, I wouldn't say it's really post COVID, but now that we're kind of getting into um okay way of life but again i'm in the new norm um yeah we're, we're picking up slowly uh the first we, we only opened like two weeks ago um and our pickup has been like gradually increasing which has been awesome um i just hope we don't have a, another lockdown oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing a holistic perspective uh, melissa so i think Janik's. uh Janik's, uh Janik has tuned in as well. Good evening, Jani. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about the delay because of a technical issue, but uh, all good, all good, all good. So, Janik, uh, you're an exception. You're the epitome of adaptability. You pivoted from the hospitality <laughs> industry to unknown territories within a short period of time, providing essential services to the general public and also supporting the local communities to make some sort of an income. Uh, during these difficult times for them. Share us your experience and how you went about things. Well, uh, to be very honest, it all started off uh, after being locked in my room for 14 days after, uh, after the Royal Thomian. So, <laughs> I was one of those people. We stuck for 14 days, <laughs> took it easy, and then we never really thought that it's going to be such a long process of coming out of a curfew period. So uh, we had, so Celeste was initially a hospitality management brand. So we were managing about six properties in Aurelia. So we had a team of staff who we had got together. Uh, we were actually just about to start going uh, as a luxury brand starting from the April season. So we were gearing up with the staff. We got a lot of new staff and did everything. And uh, just when we were about to be able to come out and do a lot of advertising, we had to go into a lockdown. Right? So then... And we thought, okay, things will probably be like this for about two weeks, maybe a month. So we kept on taking it easy, thinking that it's not going to take too long. But after the first two weeks, we realized that, um, you know, we have access to fresh produce in Morelia. We can help the farmers, we can help the community in Colombo. So we initially started it off as uh, more of like a community service, where we brought down fresh vegetables from Morelia and we started giving it to people at cost. And uh, as, as usual, I mean, uh, people didn't really... Uh, have access to like the, the fresh stuff that they would have wanted. So after about a two, three weeks of doing this, uh, we started realizing, okay, this uh, lockdown doesn't seem to be uh, coming out anytime soon. And we had uh, about 30 staff that we had to take care of um, and we wanted to keep all of them. So then we started commercializing a little bit. So, right? so then we started doing uh, a bit of deliveries. Initially, it was all done internally. So we had our own staff driving around Colombo, giving people the vegetables and doing our own deliveries. So it started off with, with being in like normal polythene bags, which we were not too happy about, but we had no access to anything else during the interview. Uh, then from that, we kind of moved up to using these, you know, these uh, bags that we used to cold store onions and stuff. Right? So one of those bags, which looked a little bit better, I guess. Um, then eventually we were able to come to a point where when uh, we meet of curfew, uh, we had a lot of uh, customers who were depending on us, a lot of families. And how we always justified is that we were able to feed, we were, we were doing close to about 200 packs a day. And that was 200 families in Colombo that we were able to cater to with a very small team that we had. Right? So we started off with that and then it gradually kept on increasing the number of numbers. And then my staff and everyone was so happy and willing to take the risk during curfew because they were like, okay. 200 orders a day means 200 families, which means they're supporting so many, like so many people. Each family, they say at least three or four people. So they all felt good about the fact that they were actually like making a difference to so many people, right? giving them access to like fresh produce. Um, so that eventually worked out to a point where even after curfew was gradually being lifted off, we started having a lot of customers who've been buying from us. Uh, sending us messages saying, hey, I know you all are going to uh, eventually probably stop this and then go back into your original business, but can you all consider 
doing this as like a long term thing because we've never had access to such uh, good fresh produce. So what we thought about is okay, there is a demand and there were so many people who needed something like this, and uh, we decided to continue and adapt as well because I mean the hospitality industry still hasn't caught up to a point where we can actually go back into it right away and depend on that. Uh, there is um, a little bit of a row again right now where the cases have gone up a bit. So with all of these, people are scared of traveling again. And even the bit of business we have with the hospitality is only during the weekends because that's the only time that the locals can travel when they start working again. And yeah. and the hardest part is that right now all the hotels are trying to compete with each other because everybody is desperate mm. in need of some revenue. So all of them are giving some really good deals and trying to attract the locals. And uh, I must say that we have to uh, really appreciate what the locals are doing because everybody is pulling out of their savings and traveling because they also want to support the industry, right? Uh, they make it, it's a win-win situation because all of them know that they can also have access to some of the properties that they would have usually not paid so much for at a bargain price. And also they're supporting the industry and helping them to retain their jobs and stay afloat. Right? So thank God for us, we were able to uh, keep every single one of our staff. Um, there was a point at the start where um, we had to pump in uh, from our personal accounts to try and keep the company going so that we can pay all the salaries. But uh, it's gradually bridging the gap now, so we can uh, we can hopefully look at a positive uh, balance later on in the future. Thanks, uh, Janik. Indeed, I would like to thank you and commend you for the support that you have extended towards the end consumers as well as the community as a whole. Uh, my next question, I'd like to uh, direct it to Ronali. Uh, do you see a transformation in consumer lifestyle and uh, including the younger generations with more people adapting to healthy eating habits and relying on more healthy organic food and beverages what would you consider as the limitation for this change? Uh, is it a financial issue? For instance, a salad could be priced at 500 rupees and a burger priced at 300 rupees. I would like to seek your thoughts. Um, I mean, it's actually pretty uh, bad because everyone thinks that eating healthy uh, is an expensive thing. Um, but in reality, it's not. Of course, you can't. It's, it's difficult to compete with the fast food market because you're eating crap. Like, I mean, there's no nutrition in it, although it comes at a cheaper price point. Um, you can eat healthy. The, the problem is people are not aware that you can eat local food um, in a healthy way instead of depending on imported goods. So, for example, I mean, eating your traditional meals like mungata, kadala, um, and using the local greens like gotukola, mukunwana, all these things are super, super healthy for you. And they come at such a low cost. Um, so, it is definitely a cheaper option. It's just that this notion that people have around healthy food being expensive. Um, I have definitely noticed a shift. Like, um, I've had a lot more people, a lot new customers um, signing up uh, with RAW on a subscription basis. So they're getting weekly juices because they realize how important of an investment it is to invest in your health. Um, even if they can't go out and um, get uh, healthy food, they can at least supplement their diet with a healthy juice. Um, so I have definitely seen that increase, but actually uh, most number of my customers have been to lose lockdown weight um, because, you know, during lockdown, they've been eating like, you know, obviously, <laughs> and, so cool. yeah. um, and now the pounds have added up and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what has happened and I need to lose this weight. So they're getting on the detox cleansers, so I've seen a... Uh, a rise in the orders for the three-day cleanse and the two-day cleanse and people inquiring how can you help me lose this lockdown weight um, so that has been um, you know uh, something different um, but yeah um, I hope to educate people more on how it is actually cost effective to eat healthy but it involves a lot of meal prep and work on your end um, but it's actually not an expensive thing to do. It, it all depends on how you really plan and, and, and manage it. And we're so blessed to have um, 
such fertile land that grows almost anything. We need to really optimize on that fact and not depend on imported goods. Um, it has been a realization and an eye opener, I think, for a lot of people that we need to start depending on our land and depending on food from other shores. Thank you, Ronali, for sharing uh, that honest and open feedback. Uh, my next question, I'd like to direct it to Jude. How seamless has starting and setting up the business in Sri Lanka been? How many employees, food delivery partners, restaurants, cafes uh, are currently on board with EP Global? How have you leveraged on creativity to sustain in the market, especially with two main big competitors? Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a question I ask myself every day. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, yeah, you know, we, we, the, the company was founded in Singapore and, um, you know, our market, uh, Sri Lanka was our first market. We were going to go to Dubai as well uh, this year, which has got delayed a bit. Uh, but when we started in uh, Sri Lanka, I think when I started the COVID relief center, um, because I was starting from scratch, it gave me a, a lot of flexibility to design the product the way I wanted to do it. So I, I, I was able to have a, a proper grocery store. Uh, you know, and, and I did not have different suppliers, et cetera, in there. So it was very easy for people to kind of go in and, and select the products very easily and check it out. And we ended up buying, uh, in fact, we bought, I think, more than uh, 10 to 15 million rupees worth of stock uh, during COVID. I think when I, when COVID started, getting passes was very difficult. Uh, that was one, one uh, massive issue. And I remember, um, I think the presidential task force, as soon as they were set up, they reached out to pick me and, and they were very uh, you know, helpful with us as well. They gave us uh, just two passes to start with. And um, you know, what I realized in Sri Lanka is, uh, to be honest, it's a very small place. So uh, you, know, you can find one supplier and he knows all the suppliers, right? So uh, it was very easy to kind of get the products, but transport was very, I mean, it was hectic. Uh, so uh, I used my own vehicles to transport. In fact, I did more than a thousand deliveries myself. Uh, during the whole process because we could not find delivery partners as well because it's the same issue that I think Uber and Pikmi had is just we did not have enough delivery riders and you know cars out there and we were not able to just get passes for thousand people if we wanted to. Uh, so you know getting supplies was one issue and that was easily sorted but transport was very difficult. So I, I ended up using my own vehicles and then I think that kind of, um, and also because Colombo is a very small place, so it's easy for you to kind of deliver during COVID. Uh, so that allowed like one person to deliver literally 45 to 50 orders a day. Uh, so having just four or five people, you could easily com you know, complete about 250 orders per day. So I would say that Colombo was fantastic. I mean, um, you know, because of the size and because of how closely connected the community is, uh, it's very easy to start, but of course we have uh, Pick Me and Uber, which are really, really good. And they've been here for a long time. So I think when COVID started, it was not about a fight because we were all working together. We were trying to kind of uh, get as many people fed and as many people as possible, uh, you know, get groceries delivered for them. I actually, what I realized is there was a lot, a lot of vegetables, to be honest, that were getting wasted because uh, they were export quality vegetables and that were getting exported. And suddenly they were not able to export it. So they had tens of, I mean, they had 10 plus tons of all types of vegetables. And I felt that the best case for me would be to take the export grade vegetables and sell it to the customers at cost. And that's exactly what we did because for us, it was very hectic to find the vegetables from the Dumbler market and so on because we were not in that, uh, in that game before. But we were able to do it with the export market. So that, that really um, made it uh, fast for us. And also we allowed people to choose whatever they want. So we did not have a fixed uh, bag of goods that we were giving. So you could choose anything and we would deliver it to you. Um, so I think with all of that, we kind of uh, set ourselves a little bit apart from Pick Me and Uber because we had a bit of user interface differences and uh, our deliveries were faster because we were doing smaller uh, loads, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think all, all the, the rider companies, uh, they really did a good job uh, during COVID. To be honest, they pulled up their socks and, and they worked really hard. I mean, I saw Pick Me delivery riders really pushing it out. Uh, and I, I personally saw a lot of them, just like us. So at the end of the day, now that COVID is over, the question comes back to, okay, how are we gonna uh, 
how are we going to remain in one industry? And I've, I've seen a lot of other companies come up for uh, food delivery and so on as well. I've not seen that many come up for grocery delivery. I mean, there are still very restricted grocery delivery companies, but food delivery, yeah, I saw a lot come up, especially the restaurants delivering themselves as well, which for me, I always wanted to support an industry where the commissions were really low. And that's for me was one of the main objectives of uh, supporting the industry. Uh, so when we when we reached out, I remember we reached out to Bakes by Bella. In fact, I think we have Barista on board. We've got uh, more than 100 plus uh, restaurants that came on board really quickly because uh, they wanted to find a way to uh, just get their food out. And we basically, what we did is we allowed uh, the restaurants to deliver to any area. So we didn't just say it's going to be a five kilometer radius or, you know, restricted areas. You could deliver all the way up to Ratmalana as well if you wanted to. Uh, so a lot of restaurants were trying to push uh, on, on deliveries further out from Colombo because a lot of the deliveries we got were from Mount Lavinia, Ratmalana, Watkala, you know, the places where Same, people just yeah. could not get food delivered. Um, and yeah. I think Colombo was, I mean, Colombo was fine. They, they were always sorted out, but I really felt uh, I wanted to help out the, the suburbs that were outside of Colombo. So even till today, I think uh, at the end of the day, food delivery is the same. Whatever you do, uh, you know, we all do the same thing. Uh, I think we all uh, we all try to give the best deal for the customer, and that's where, to be honest, the competitive edge comes up in terms of how much you're funded and and so on. But at the end of the day, um, I think the customer once they adopt us, uh, an app, they are very sticky to that app. So a lot of people adopted us because of the groceries, and in fact, all the people that buy food from us are grocery customers. So we don't actually have direct customers who just come in only for the food. So we've, we've got more than 2,500 uh, customers for groceries and, and they buy from us uh, quite often. Uh, so for us, having that database was uh, the big advantage for us. Uh, and we're trying to completely le leverage on that and then try and see how we can develop the food delivery. But I'm, I'm more keen on the grocery delivery because even till today, in fact, we just started grocery deliveries within three hours to your home uh, last week. And we're trying to get groceries delivered 60 minutes uh, and that's our that's our goal over the next week is to try and deliver every grocery within 60 minutes uh, and we just actually uh, put in about 5,900 products into our app uh, in fact it's going to be released over the next week uh, we've got about 3,000 products now but we're going to have everything that a supermarket has uh, and I think you know that's where we're going to be a little bit different and, and we're going to complement the market um, you know in, in, in what it needs. Thank you, Jude. Indeed, a very interesting and engrossing perspective that you shared. Thank you again for that. Uh, my next question I'd like to direct it to Dilupa. Uh, I mean, coffee being the main product of Barista, did you notice a change in customer patterns and preferences during the period of COVID-19? Were sweet snacks and desserts given precedence over other items on the menu as it's considered as an ultimate stress reliever? Well, uh, the, the simple answer for that question is yes, we saw. Uh, during the month of April, our composition of sales was about 60% desserts. On a normal day, it was about 65% coffee and 35% food in our, our, our cafes. The, and if you need an um, expanded explanation to that, I would say consumer is def definitely going to change. And if we are to believe that it is not going to happen, I think that's a misconception because we really need to see the gravity of this uh, pandemic, right? So this is not a normal crisis. This can't be even, uh, you know, um, how do I say, uh, come closer to the financial crisis that uh, the world has experienced in 2008. It is not any closer to the East attack that we have experienced in 2019. This actually attacks, this virus actually attacks the core of our business, restaurants, cafes, and pubs. What we really serve uh, uh, to the consumer is we are talking about socializing. We are talking about camaraderie. We want to people to come get socialized with us. But what is the remedy for this virus? What the whole world is talking about? They want people to stay inside, 
and they're talking about social distances. So that actually attacks the core of our business. So if somebody to come and say everything is going to be all right after the pandemic, uh, that's, I would say like, you know, pardon me, it's bullshit. It's bullshit, right? The consumer is going to change their patterns of buying will, going to, will definitely going to change. And I, as a personal person who's running a cafe, I should understand you can't get a pandemic job done with a pre-pandemic method to be in the business post-pandemic. So definitely we need to find uh, to fine tune our strategies to adapt to the new consumer behavior. So how I analyzed this uh, situation, I would say there are three phases of this pandemic. One thing is the real pandemic that we couldn't come out of our houses. Secondly, what we are right now in. Though we can come out, but this is not the normal life that we used to. And second, thirdly, if the second wave would not come, now we all are seeing a light at the end of the channel and that light will be also switched off if the second wave <laughs> comes to play, yeah. right? So third phase would be the realization. So each and every phase, the consumer will react differently. So at the pandemic level, what we saw was fear and uncertainty. Like they were so scared that they'll get it because they didn't know about this. They said, if you go out, that will come and catch me. And there was a lot of uncertainty. What will happen? Whether we have food to eat, whether we have our, you know, transport to go, whether we will we'll have our jobs to go back. So that was the uncertainty period. And then... At that particular point, everybody was thinking about survival and they wanted food. And they were, I think they were really stressed out. So that is why probably the cravings of ice creams and desserts were like 60%, right? I, I was like, we couldn't, I, I think Bala would agree that yes. you, can't, you could not, you know, serve, service the demand that you had. Yeah. But now to the COVID, like now we can go out, now the consumer will be concerned and frustrated. One thing, when I go out, I am more exposed to this virus. So I'm very concerned about my safety. Secondly, what the heck will happen next day, right? Because he must have, you know, you know, got a, some, most of the people were laid off and the price cuts, uh, you know, the salary cuts are in, in play and the businesses like the entrepreneurs, the people who export, people who are in the tourism industry, they have actually, you know, lost their way of income. So there is frustration. So for, for a brand, then we need to, you know, adjust our strategies to service that, you know, kind of needs day. And finally, people come to realization. Okay, fine. This is how we are going to live this life, right? So you will, be, you will have to have a mask every day. You will have to, you know, sit next to your partner. And once I went to a restaurant. And then I went with my wife. The steward came and said, uh, sir, you can't, you know, I pulled that, that chair to sit next to her. Then the chair, the, the steward came and said, me, you can't, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> sit next to your wife. That was absurd, but that is how they've been instructed. So will that serve a person coming out of uh, home and having a coffee, coming out of home and having that expensive 600 rupees, 700 rupee coffee? So that's that's not going to happen. So as marketeers and as business owners, entrepreneurs, we really need to read this consumer. And if I'm again saying, sometimes crisis brings clarity also to the business. So I have been like being the largest cafe, like we had about 10 cafes. So I've been talking to my directors, I'm talking uh, in our, our board meeting that we need to generalize this coffee culture. Right? So the coffee has been in Sri Lanka for the 18 years, no one to blame but us, been a, a luxurious thing, right? Uh, the luxurious thing that you, you would not, you know, have three coffees a day. I, I mean, I have two coffees a day because it comes free of charge to me. But anybody, I would say, 700 rupee a coffee, 
that's, that's a difficult thing, right? So we have never been, uh, you know, pushing this brand to be a functional brand. So what will remain in the consumer when his discretionary income is affected? The functional products. The luxurious product is the things that they're going to cut first. So whether you want to keep coffee and your cakes and your desserts luxurious or whether you want to keep it functional. So that was the multi-million question that the board or maybe the, the management should ask. So that has to be done, I think, uh, to survive long run. To survive long run for another two years to three years. I so maybe that's what we all need to think about. Yeah. Thank you, Vinupa, for sharing that uh, perspective. Uh, my, next, my next question, I'd like to uh, direct it to Melissa and Runali. Uh, considering women empowerment and female entrepreneurs, is this segment limited to areas within and around Colombo? What are some of the limitations in your own perspectives? Do you see government, private and public initiated programs in the past, present to encourage and facilitate women, uh, women-led businesses? How do you encourage prospective entrepreneurs, especially in SME sector, to contribute positively and effectively to the overall economy of Sri Lanka? I'd like to start with Melissa. Um, okay. So from what I have been seeing recently is um, the obviously the employment of women in this country is quite low. Um, yes, within Colombo, there are amazing women in positions of power that we've all been seeing. But over, overall, um, I, I haven't seen that many initiatives to actually get women um, more into work. And also, especially when we're focusing on the rural parts of this country, I feel there's a lot of backwardness that's also attached um, with a lot of women where, say for example, from what I've seen at least, they're married off quite young, they already have their families in place. Um, from a few people that I've interacted with, it's always been a point of how can I leave my family come to work? Um, if I move to Colombo, what would happen to my family? It's all about, it's always been about, okay, having to come to Colombo to start something. Now, um, I heard recently that there is an initiative that's actually taking place. Uh, I'm not at liberty to share too much information about it at this point, but it is to, um, to work towards empowering women um, and convince them to actually get into work and, you know, with their own startups where the government is meant to be helping them with, you know, initial startup funding. Um, mm -hmm. Something like that, an initiative like that. When I heard about it, I was like, oh, that's wonderful. Um, and would definitely love to be on board in terms of supporting something like that. Um, but I mean, I have to say like from the time I moved back here, I moved back in 2011. Since then to now, yes, there has definitely been um, a level of progression in terms of women entering work and um, having their own startups. I've seen an increase in it for sure from what it was back then. But can it be better? Yes. Do more women need help and more of a push to, you know, kind of start their own thing, the confidence to kind of know that they'll be backed up yes they do need it um but i have to say like uh, the uncertainty of this whole pandemic situation at this point is uh because it, again it's uncharted it's completely uncharted territory everybody is just tiptoeing around what's going to happen next at this stage so uh, i wouldn't be able to say that now is the best time to kind of dabble or go into something like that but hopefully the moment this subsides things will start to look start to look up again that's my take on it thank you melissa runali if i could get your perspective as well um i mean looking at the statistics uh, more women graduate from university in sri lanka and there is a, a larger population of women in sri lanka than men but yet we see more female unemployment than male employment. So what's going on there? 
clearly there's some sort of systemic problem uh, that's taking place there because there is a greater percentage of the population that's educated coming out of university yet uh, there's more unemployment in that area um, so clearly there is something going wrong in the system um, in terms of entrepreneurship and women um, I've had um, a great opportunity to work with some women in uh, the grassroots that have absolutely amazing ideas and that have started um, little cottage industries and small home home based businesses but the problem is they do, they have no idea about marketing they have no idea about business development or branding so i feel that there's a huge lack in the market for for capacity building and even not even in a financial capacity even if the government gets involved in in supporting them in sharing knowledge and showing them how they can take this product to market um it would be a great help to them um and in my personal experience i haven't seen much support at all um i mean like i have gone through a few issues melissa is quite familiar with it and so has she and i mean she had my back recently with an issue i was going through and that's not something that you normally see you don't get uh this community of women who are even strong and standing up for each other but i guess that stems from not having a system in place um and not having that support system uh, so it's just something like ad hoc you live you learn and um you know you you support each other it's just kind of that sort of thing um so it will definitely be really beneficial if they started some sort of um support system like that especially for women um not just in colombo as malishla mentioned in rural areas as well which is where they need it the most um and just help uplift um women in our community thanks ronali for your response uh, my next question i'd like to direct it to jude Uh, what is your perspective on the gig economy do you see an evolution in the gig economy related to the food and beverage industry uh, i mean certainly it offers more flexibility for a worker from a business perspective i mean you're paying per engagement so you get a balance in terms of uh, the cost as well and you acquire a skill resource for that particular engagement what are your thoughts on this No I th- I think it's definitely growing. I I think it's growing mostly because of uh, the sudden demand uh, for services that mostly were unplanned before. In the sense most of the companies were not ready. So uh, a lot of people really started hiring lots of third parties and lots of people who would just work on contract um you know it, it was a lot easier it was a lot faster. Um and I think um especially with covid I I think what I noticed is uh, especially during covid there were not a lot of people who were willing to come out but there are lots of people who are staff as well who just would not will they wouldn't come out but they were doing a good job from home but they would not come out and and suddenly you had a set of people who said okay I'm going to come out and I'm going to help out and and so on but they were third parties right and and I think that's how it started and it grew from there but now we ended up relying on those third parties more and more because the demand is just quite heavy especially in the online game uh with the deliveries really i mean if you if you if you think about all the deliveries of groceries that have taken place i think per day you you've had at least maybe close to 15000 orders uh service between kills cargills us and other other companies minimum right and and for all of this to be delivered uh, you had to have a lot of third parties um so i i feel it's just the demand uh, that's driving it but i think it's also very specific in logistics so i really don't know how it's um how it's been in the uh, tech field because normally the tech field we hire full time uh, we've used we've used part time people but then in tech field because of the confidentiality and and uh, you know the skill levels it's always good to have full time staff uh but i i know definitely in logistics it has grown and and tech field it's always it was always there but, you know through uh, i think websites like upwork that allowed people to work for other people even from other countries so if you just look at all the freelance websites i think if you just study them you'll understand that they are definitely growing especially through covid 
and therefore the market is growing very heavily. Now, I tried to use Upwork and other freelance websites to get people to do design work, uh, even coding work. Uh, but in Sri Lanka, we just have a lot of talent. So, you know, we wouldn't need, uh, you know, the part-time people overseas or, or part-time people, you know, most of the time. In fact, we have lots of full-time people available. Uh, so I feel in Sri Lanka, yes, in Singapore, I realized uh, that uh, it's, it's a mu much larger market because of the cost. So when you go into third parties, the cost does come down a bit because you're able to kind of be keep people focused on the, on the particular goal and pay them per hour or pay them per day, etc. And that kind of brings the eventual cost down. Um, and Singapore and Australia, in fact, I, I have a hotel business in Australia. That was my main business that I was having. Uh, which shut down. Uh, we used to, in fact, we outsourced all of our reservations, all of our marketing, all of our sales. Everything was done through freelancers, uh, working from Philippines and, and Sri Lanka as well. So the market is definitely growing, I feel. And, and um, I think as it goes, um, you're going you're gonna to find that most people now are just working uh, remotely. So uh, they tend to now not like full-time contracts. I mean, I, I've had some people who said, look, I just want to try freelance because it's, it's, you know, I've been approached by different people and I want to try out lots of different things. Uh, but I'm still happy to work with you. You know, uh, so that, that's definitely, I think, uh, going to continue and grow. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Thanks, uh, Judy. Indeed, you did. Thank you Thanks for today. sharing uh, that uh, insight. Uh, my next question, I'd like to direct it to uh, Janik. Uh, Janik, you have a digital platform. How ready was it for scalability or how ready is it for scalability? Uh, there could be a surge in uh, customer demand. There was a surge in customer demand during the period of COVID with the imposed lockdown, uh, with minimum access to food, groceries and daily essentials. How, do you, how, did you manage the, how did you manage the key metric of order lead time? Typically, the longer the lead time, a customer, a typical customer would be anxious. And the main value proposition of the digital platform, which is convenience and a prompt service, could get disrupted. So a typical customer would take it out on social media and lodge a complaint. Have you had similar situations? If yes, how did you handle it? Okay, so that's a lot in one share. So, <laughs> so to start with, initially, um, I saw a lot of others in the market who've been in been around for some time, who had the platforms, the entire infrastructure, who were having a bit of a tough time and having a lot of customers complaining and giving them a lot of um, bad publicity. Right? So when I saw that, I spoke to my entire team and I said one thing, I said, I don't want to be put up there. I don't want my face or our company in there. So if we can do 10 orders a day, that's all we're going to do properly. Right? So if our capacity was 200, that was the max that we're going to do. We're not going to take up anything more than what we could do. So uh, we were doing averaging about 200 orders a day. And even during COVID, luckily we were able to do those within about three hours uh, of receiving the order, right? Uh, on, a, on a day that we had a lot of uh, backlog where we got busy, we took about five, six hours. But otherwise, between, within three hours, we were able to dispatch those orders and get it to people, right? Now, um, that being said, we didn't have our own website. We didn't have any of the infrastructure that we needed to have this. All we did was, uh, after a while, we were selling on Facebook and uh, through WhatsApp. And then that uh, moved on to uh, PickMe. And then PickMe was the only operator for some time. And then after that, we were able to get on Uber. And then gradually, we were able to get quite a few through all of that. Right? And then after that, we just launched our website about, about a week back. Um, you just placed an order this morning, so that's you <laughs> <laughs> um, So uh, we launched the website, and what we really wanted to see is we wanted to be make it as easy as possible for anybody who would get on it, and uh, for them to be able to have a uh, smooth order process, right? Um, but in terms of being able to cater to a large number of orders, if it comes to a point where we uh, and we go into a situation of a lockdown or anything like that happens again, uh, we will not be able, to, we are not going to take up with the public. So, we, until we could actually expand, we are not going to 
market ourselves too much to a point where we, we will have too much of a demand because we will only stay within what we can and only once our website and everything is prepared we will be able to uh, cater that demand that we are going to do so even the marketing we do right now and all that is within our means we don't want to just over market ourselves and show the entire uh, at least the whole of Colombo that oh Celeste is here to like you know give you your stuff so we can we have unlimited number of produce no we, we can't do that so right now if we're doing 150 averaging right now since the COVID the, 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 the 100 to 150 orders we're doing, that's the max we're doing right now within our capabilities. So we don't want to push that to 200, 250 at once and then have people who are happy. Right? So we would rather have the 100 or 150 people customers who trust us and believe in us when we place an order to be 100% happy and satisfied with the order rather than trying to push our numbers high and have more of the companies come. I mean, we did have quite a few complaints that came up on social media. Uh, but Thank God I was able to call each and every one of them, talk to them personally. And all of them were able to just turn it around and put a post again, like giving us uh, uh, positive uh, feedback. Right? Like they were able to say that you know, these guys uh, had a bit of a mis uh, miscommunication or this happened. And within within a matter of hours, they sent me a replacement and it was done. So that helped us a lot. So we didn't really have to do much to market ourselves because uh, it's all about word of mouth and all that as well in Colombo, right? So we have a lady who would order from us and if she was happy with it, she would tell all of her friends on their WhatsApp groups and all of that. That, okay, I ordered from them, I got it, it's fresh, whatever. And then they would also keep ordering from us. So one thing that I felt that people didn't really understand at that point, where we had some, most of our orders were based on that, where people didn't realize that uh, all the companies, all of the businesses that were operating during the curfew were operating with a lot of uh, overheads and a lot of things that we have never had to deal with and never had to account for. Right? I mean, for an example, all of my staff had to be picked up from home and dropped off on a daily basis. Uh, we had to give them all three meals while they were working. We had to give them pretty much everything that had to be given because there were no shops yeah. out there they can go and buy something. Uh, then you're using sanitizer, you're using gloves in a, for every single position, masks that have to be changed. Sometimes twice a day. Um, then so many different things that we had to bring up and do to be able to maintain certain standards and make sure that we're uh, keeping this uh, standard that we want to have in terms of because everybody trusts us when we keep on saying that okay we are packing and giving your goods in a sanitized uh, environment. Right? So all of these things were actually things that people didn't realize that we had. So I had to pretty much call a few people who complained saying that our prices are too high and explain and say, uh, listen, back then we could have given you the price, right? So you can't compare the prices of our vegetables that we are giving you to the price of what you're going to buy from the truck that comes and uh, sells it at your gate. Because there were a large number of trucks that were driving around Colombo, going down streets and selling vegetables. So we had customers mm. who were comparing our prices to that and putting it on yeah. social media and complaining, right? So I had to tell them that those people are doing a fantastic job. But for us, we had so many other overheads and we had to have so much that we had to spend on. Right? And we even had things like uh, we had to buy uh, certain types of sanitization to spray on all the vegetables, uh, the, the building, the you know, food building, right? And so all that were things that we had to help them understand. And I realized that a lot of companies uh, couldn't really get that message across to the consumers so that they understood that this is why it's like this. This is why we can't uh, give you at the same price. This is, these are the restrictions we also have. Um, so that is something that as an industry, all of us, I think, probably failed in trying to get that message across to the consumers in general. So because we didn't, they always kept on comparing to the post-COVID situation. Right? So I couldn't, even, even Celeste, uh, we couldn't put that message out there. But every time we had complaints from people about pricing and stuff, right? we were able to call them, talk to them, explain, and then all of them straight away understood. And they said, yeah, you know what? Like if people understood that, we'd be more patient. And we'd, we'd understand that, you know, your staff are working over time, that we want this and we'd appreciate all of that. Because uh, it's just that they wouldn't picture that. They're just sitting in the comfort of their home and they have this stuff coming straight to their doorstep. And they don't, they've not really had a reason to think beyond that. So that's pretty much all we had to deal with. And we were blessed that we didn't have to deal with a lot of complaints like that. So far, we, I probably count the number of complaints we had on social media. But uh, thank God all of them were quite uh, easy to deal with after we spoke to them and they just took it off. So, yeah. Thank you, Jani, for sharing that uh, captivating response and feedback.
Uh, my next question, I mean, there's a live audience that is actually viewing this uh, particular webinar, and it's an audience-related question that I'd like to direct it, and I'd like to direct it to Dupa. Uh, this is related to discounts and rebates. Were you compelled to leverage on such a strategy to keep the revenues afloat during the period of COVID? Well, honestly, uh, I would say it, it was Hobson's choice. Right. So uh, people, the initial thing for us was to keep the brand alive during the pandemic. Right? And the other thing was, uh, as a brand that was predominantly surviving from coffee, uh, when we felt like people will first cut the coffee out, and when you have little better margins on beverages and that, that is the industry norm than, than food. Uh, that is something that we had to do, right? So, and at the same time, if you take all the restaurants and all the cafes uh, in, in Colombo, they were all panicked, to be very frank with you. After, after two to three weeks, they knew that this is not going to, you know, reopen so that we all need to get into. For an example, I'll tell you, uh, I was very confident and um, comfortable with the Uber only be my exclusive delivery partner because people were coming into cafes and if they really need their coffee they will only order it through uh, uber eats a delivery partner but it came to a point that only my 13 to 14 percent of delivery was the only survivor for me during that time and at the same time there were so many restaurants coming in and you know getting into that portion of uh, you know, revenue for the consumer, right? And, and, and if you really think like this way, now we being cafes, we being restaurants, we charge consumer, not only for the food, right? We charge for the ambience, we charge for the experience, we charge uh, for the service and we charge for everything. Is it fair for us to charge the same thing if that was delivered to his home? That was a one question, right? So people will not pay for my ambience, my AC, and for the services and all that. In fact, to be very frank with you, my overheads were like in the particular period of time, about 80% less because I operated all my brands, all my outlets in one outlet. And all my brands were under one roof. And those were going out to everywhere. And we had about 10 employees working and most of them are at home and some of them never turned back after two months, right? So in that case, there was a saving for the restaurant as well. And if you are to have your coffee delivered to your home, you should be a very functional, very loyal coffee lover. So what I need right now is to save each and every coffee lover after the pandemic. Right? So in that case, yes, beverages were encouraged. But food, you would all agree, food is very difficult. Food is something that uh, we probably will have very less margins. So that game was played. And that game was played actually with a lot of clarity in our strategically, strategically also. Because after the pandemic, if the brand is like, it's like your top of the mind awareness. If your brand is not seen during the pandemic time, or if your brand is not conceived during the pandemic time, then probably after the pandemic, you would, you know, you would lose the, the top of the mind awareness so that it will drive your sales also in, in, into a different direction. So that was done. Yes, I can tell you that. Thank you, Dilupa. I certainly hope that question was, uh, that audience related question was answered. Uh, my next question, I'd like to direct it to Melissa and Ronali. Uh, considering the importance of social media in building and promoting a business, maintaining relationships and engagement with the customers, even during the period of COVID-19, uh, do you reckon there will be physical restaurants, cafes in the future? Or do, we, do you see a complete paradigm shift of only having digital stores what would you consider as some of the limitations if this transition takes place? I'd like to first start with uh, Ronali. 
Um, I personally think that we are coming into a second lockdown. Um, some of you may not like me for saying this, but uh, I strongly feel this way that after elections, we'll probably get another lockdown. Um, and I think that as much as, I mean, I, I'm someone personally who loves to go out and have a meal once in a while, meet up with my friends, you know. But um, that being said, I think all businesses need to start thinking digital uh, during this uh, time because there are unprecedented times and people are more cautious to go out and about. So you need to think about your online presence at the same time, figure out how you can cover your costs um, if you have a rented space and if you have um, the location that you need to cover your overheads for. Uh, but I think it's becoming increasingly uh, more important to focus on your online presence. That is so, so important, I think, during this time. Um, and, and just figure a way around this because I think this is here to stay for a while more. At least till the end of the year, um, there, there, there are going to be... Um, these restrictions so i think it's important to look at look at that side of things for sure thanks uh, ronali melissa if i could uh, seek your perspective as well so for me um yes the uh, online presence the digital presence is something that i've always worked on um from the moment this started so for me like being an instagram startup i have always had that online presence but my 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 issue is with it switching to just purely digital at this point it's like for people like me that's a problem because um i mean i only opened my new spot in january and i've signed my contract uh, for the next five years if i switch to digital i am screwed so <laughs> these are like serious issues that i would uh, have to you know really really think about if if we ever have to you know kind of be in a situation if I'm faced by a situation like this because for me um, just purely digital is a, a no-go and understanding that for a pandemic to kind of leave the world it'll take at least two years I know that we're gonna have to kind of switch around and adjust and you know do our best to kind of still sustain ourselves. Um, I don't know, like honestly, my answer to that is I can't, like for a person like me, I am, um, I literally have a one-off place, but I have put everything I have into this and I cannot um, just go purely digital. I, I have salaries to pay, I have rent to pay, I have to do whatever I can to sustain my location to the best of my ability whilst adhering to every single precaution in the book. Um, but yeah, solely, I understand how solely digital is something that, that makes sense at a time like this, but also given that people like us, we are social beings. We do like to go out, interact with our friends. Um, meet other people even if you're being a loner you'd rather just you'd want to have the option of going to sit in a cafe or a restaurant and just be by yourself like i'm one of those people um so i know that not everybody as a consumer would appreciate um things being solely digital as well so i mean given that we just came out of this pandemic as well and people were so starved of, of things to do because after being holed up at home for three months, everybody was stopped. Hey, that's why like my spot, for example, let's take the loop, uh, you know, uh, with Barista, you, you did see an influx for the simple reason that we are not made to stay indoors and just be online, you know? So I, I, as much as yes, I understand with safety reasons and all that, it is the more advised advisable way as humans i i mean we do need the interaction with other humans um so i think us being open is a must and we must somehow get it going sure i can't <laughs> <Yeah>. agree more <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you, you know for your honesty, I'm just to, Melissa. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Into that, like, you know, what we as restaurants, pubs, clubs, and cafes, what we sell, it's not the product only. It's the complete experience that we sell, the aroma, the coffee, the, the sound, the music, the people, how much money that we have invested on it. Like now, I've seen, just now I've seen your Instagram. Uh, how much detail that you have put into the plating of the food. But when you do it in digital, when you send it that food through a plastic container, will yeah. it work? Will Correct. people pay the same money? Will exactly. the condition of the food? I mean, how much? I mean, before yeah, this pandemic, yeah. I know how much pressure that we put on to these guys, the kitchen guys, the serving yeah. guys, to bring the food right into the consumer's table. But this food was kept 20 minutes to pick up. And right. then another 25 minutes to their home, and then they eat it, and then they unpack it. Unpack it. Where is the feeling? So it's know. all about feelings. A food industry is yeah. feeling. If I, if I am to seriously, if this pandemic works, and if that is everything to be go go digital, I don't think I'll survive. I, I know. Yeah. Same. Thank you, Dilupa, for pitching in. Uh, my next question, I'd like to direct it to uh, Janik and Jude. Uh, it's it's a question where I'd like to leverage from uh, Runali's answer as well. Uh, in the event, hopefully not, but if there is a second wave of COVID-19, uh, which safety measures would you undertake related to your business? And what would you intend on doing differently in, in comparison to wave one? I'd like to first start with you. Okay, sorry, I was on mute. Okay, um, I think um, in terms of safety precautions, um, as far as I can understand, um, we're following everything that the government tells us. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I try to keep it to what they say and not what I just see online and so on. Uh, I think that uh, so far the, the, the you know contactless delivery has been something that we've always uh, you know focused on having the right equipment like the masks and the gloves and you know gloves is another thing that i don't really believe in too much because you know people just use one glove for the entire day which defeats the purpose okay. uh, so so uh, things like gloves you need to kind of uh, you know keep changing frequently and and also the same thing with the mask as well when you're delivering you're going to be sweating like crazy so uh, i think you know, focusing on changing the equipment as much as possible, that's number one. Uh, using hand sanitizer, even if you've got the mask, uh, even if you've got the gloves on is something that's important because the gloves is not going to do anything uh, if you just use the same glove the whole day, right? So um, that's, that's basically what I would say I would focus on is changing the equipment as much as we can and then following what the government says, especially when it comes to where we store the vegetables and so on. It's very strict because the PHIs come there quite often. Um, and there's lots of regulations to follow, especially if you're looking after, uh, if you're an ISO and HSCCB certified uh, vegetable distributor, there's a, a lot more regulations to follow. Uh, I think in terms of what we'll do uh, differently, I think uh, this time around, I'm going to have all the products. Uh, that's, that's one thing that I'm going to do. Um, in fact, uh, I wanted to have everything, uh, and I realized that there's about 5,900 plus types of products in the Sri Lankan market. So having all the products is one thing. The second thing is uh, that the time of delivery, I think I really am going to try and focus on uh, you know, a 60-minute maximum two-hour delivery window because a lot of people really struggled when companies you know, always deliver the next day because it's, it was hard to plan. So the delivery time is something that I'm going to look into very carefully, especially with the already ready uh, delivery force. Yeah. So next time I, when I go in to get the pass, I'm going to go and get a pass for 100 people. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to negotiate for two and three. Uh, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready with the whole operation. So uh, I think I'm going to be a bit more prepared. Um, in terms of looking after the customers and the pricing of all the goods, this is something that I really struggled with um, during COVID. Uh, getting vegetables uh, and so on at a, at a fair price was not easy because of the fact that a lot of people stug struggled with logistics. I think this time around, I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to make sure that we've set the supply chains, uh, you know, accordingly so that the prices are quite, um, you know, uh, I would say fair in all, all manner. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that's going to be a big difference from how we started off because we had a lot more uh, 
cost to pass on to the customer, but this time around, we're a lot more streamlined. Uh, and I think I'm also going to try and help as many farmers as I can, because last time I felt that uh, I was not able to really contribute too much to the farming community, because a lot of people still had lots of vegetables that were just rotting, uh, and they had no way to sell it. And, and um, I think we're, we're a bit better prepared now to reach out to the farmers directly too, and not just the suppliers. So we're going to try and help out as many farmers as possible in terms of uh, logistics, number one, and also selling their products. Um, and I think, to be honest, if you put all of that together with a good, uh, good you know, easy to use technology, I think it makes it easy for the customer to kind of uh, you know, order their daily essentials. Um, and it's going to be a lot different from the first time. Uh, I hope I answered that question very really well. Yeah. Thank you, Jude. Johnny? Okay, so I have a slightly different uh, approach towards that. So we are trying really hard to be sustainable. So in terms of our packaging and everything we want to do, we're trying really hard to be sustainable. As much as I agree with uh, what Jude said in terms of having to change your gloves and masks and all of that, uh, ideally I would love that. But then another thing that we also need to think about is trying to be sustainable. I mean, you can't, if you look at the amount of gloves and masks that have been thrown away during this period, there's so much that's going to be attributed in terms of like uh, the culture. So another way of looking at it is you're not wearing your gloves just to protect uh, the stuff that you're touching. It's also so that you can, at the end of the day, you just take your gloves and you throw it away and it's not going to be on your fingers. You just wash your hands and then the staff are safe, right? So uh, in terms of how you pack it in a sanitized area and you're careful in how you don't allow anybody out, outside to come in without disinfecting themselves. All that is completely our responsibility. And, I mean, uh, everybody who orders from us, they trust us and they have nothing but that trust that they can have uh, when they place an order in terms of the quality of the produce that we give them uh, and also how we sanitize it. For me, uh, even if I tried to cut a little corner because it was just too difficult, I had to deal with my father who would come in as like a completely independent inspection, you know, just walks in and then he's like, hey, listen, like, I'm not going to bring those things into our house, which means you can't do that into uh, to any of your customers, right? So he started pushing us to bring in these uh, machines to sanitize the entire uh, flow areas, getting all of our staff to dip the vegetables in like uh, this chlorinated water so that it will clean up to a certain extent and doing all these stuff that were additional expenses for us, but we had to do it because we were trying to be as uh, like, sanitized as possible, right? And being careful. So, as you said, moving forward, if there is a situation, unfortunate situation, where we lock down again, uh, what we would want to do uh, to approach that would be, a, now we're actually prepared. Before we were operating from uh, an, a property that we had, which is not really fit to be able to cater such a big demand. So now we're located in Colombo, uh, close, uh, close to Havelock City, so we're centrally located. It's easier for us to dispatch from there. We have more space for us to bring in and store all the stuff that we want. Uh, initially, because we were involved in agriculture, we didn't have a problem in getting the links to our fresh produce. So we had enough and more links with the farms directly in getting them. Uh, so we were able to help out a lot of farmers in getting their crops uh, right across here to Colombo. But uh, as, as Jude said, there were a lot of people who were finding it tough. I mean, we didn't have the type of competency to help all of those farmers. But I'm pretty sure if we get together, we should be able to do it and I'll be more than happy to help you out with uh, yeah. putting you in touch with all the farmers that I have uh, access to because we have our farms in, in Nabeer. Yeah. Um, there are so many people we can support. And I think as entrepreneurs, if everyone gets together, there's a lot that we can do for each other. Um, yeah. And not just helping out the farmers. One of the things that we've been really happy to be able to do right now is help a lot of homegrown businesses. There are so many people who've started uh, from the little juices to uh, whatever that they're making at home that they couldn't really send across to customers during the curfew, right? So that was their bread and butter. They were, they were making desserts, they were making so many little dishes that they were doing, uh, which was pretty much their income that they couldn't do because as an individual, they can't go and get a pass and say, hey, I'm doing uh, like a biryani delivery, so I need a, I need a pass. So that the police can't control uh, all this stuff by giving it individuals. So they were asking for business registrations, they were asking for established businesses to be able to give you those passes. So we would like to have, that's why right now we're working on having a platform to be able to bring in all these people so that they can actually like give us their uh, material that we can take in, right? 
So we want to bring all of that in and give them the opportunity to just be like, uh, if even if it's a situation that we have to go and pick it up from them, uh, we will pick it up and bring it in. So because we are not really concentrating on a mass scale, right? We are not right now. Our focus is mainly Colombo, and with Colombo, if our maximum reach is going to be 400 orders, 300 orders a day, we want to do that 300 orders to the best of our ability. And then we can scale it up afterwards in the way we could in terms of, uh, you know, increasing the number of outlets we can have, uh, increasing the staff and all of that. But right now, this is all we can do. And also another thing that we were able to do to make sure that our staff are not really going and interacting and, uh, you know, going in public transport or going around, uh, going to, back to their villages and coming back or going even to their own households on a daily basis. We gave all of them accommodation and we kept them on site because we didn't want them going out of this uh, situation. Right? Because for us, more than anything else, uh, I was coming back to my house where I had my family, my parents and everybody. And I didn't want to bring something back home. So I told my staff, I said, listen, if you're all, if you're all going to be working in the same room, in the same uh, facility, I need all of you to understand that we have to be uh, locked up. Right? You can't be going around. It's pretty much going to be the office and your accommodation, that's it. And if anybody had a problem with that, they were more than welcome to go back home. They will still continue with their salary uh, in the capacity that we can do, which is the basics. But apart from that, we are not going to be able to uh, allow them to keep traveling up and down. So right now, in the last month, since things have got a bit relaxed, we gave them the opportunity to go home. But uh, now it's coming to a point where we're starting to tell them again that we're not, giving, we're not asking them to come and leave on site, but we're asking them to at least take private uh, like transportation, at least a tuk tuk so that they don't get, they're not in a public transportation mixed up with so many people when they're coming in um, and coming into our office, which we have sanitized, right? So that's pretty much uh, how we would like to approach it and be prepared. But like I said, we want to focus mainly on trying to see how many people we can support along in uh, this way of, uh, in our journey, uh, because everybody suffers right now. It's not just us. Every industry you take, whether it's bars, restaurants, pubs, uh, cafes, uh, hotels, everyone. Even somebody who just has a small electronic store, all of it, everyone is suffering. They have uh, rents that they have to pay. They have uh, overheads, everything. Right? So we all have to see how we can support each other and see how uh, we can we can pull somebody else's weight a bit as well. Right? We, I'm, I'm proud to say that we had at least about four different uh, home vendors who we were able to support during this period who gave us their products and we were it's a very small number but for me to say that we were able to help this person give them a bit of exposure uh, and help them build up a brand and have some revenue coming in on a daily basis for them to be able to continue their uh, their business uh, was, was an achievement so we are only looking at growing that number uh, and right now we have the platform and the infrastructure website and everything set up for us to be able to do that um, in the scale that we could. They're not, they're not uh, a massive company. We don't have uh, the type of resources that the others have at the moment. But we want to get there, but within our uh, capabilities, like, you know, in due time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jani, for sharing that feedback. Uh, so we have an audience related question, uh, and that is also to you, Janik. Uh, Janik, can you please tell us about the range of products to sold in your store? And do you have any products that is suitable for a person trying to have a healthy lifestyle? So this is, uh, this is from Sudarshan uh, <laughs> Right. Okay, so I, I know where he's getting there. So, uh, so basically, <laughs> So we have, um, right now we're focusing mainly on uh, fresh items, right? So we have fresh vegetables, uh, fruits, and dairy products. Uh, and then to complement that, we have a few other dry goods that we're maintaining, but mainly fresh. Um, so then we, recently we just launched a new line of uh, fresh cola candles uh, and juices, smoothies, and things like that. Um, nothing too fancy, just, you know, basic juices, a few uh, shooters, uh, more than anything else, one thing that we're really happy to do is the polar candle, the porridge range, because uh, that's something that I feel like, uh, because we have this a lot, right? Right now, at home on a daily basis, before we leave the house, we're given so many different types of uh, porridge, like candle, saying, oh, this one increases your, you know, helps with your immunity system, this helps with that. And there are a lot of people who don't 
have access to these uh, in Colombo because one thing is they don't have the time because they need to rush to work. They don't have the time to make it and all of that. So that's something that we introduced uh, about a week ago and uh, we're trying to push that out as well. So, yeah. Thanks, I thanks, Sunny. Yes, I hope so too. <laughs> uh, there's uh, one more for you. There's one more for you. Uh, how, uh, Jani Jaisuria, how do you pick your products produce as it's a tough job when it's delivered and not handpicked by the customer? This question is from Danu in Sitambi. Okay. So um, basically, whatever we have in our store, initially, like, first of all, are things that we have tried and tested and that we like, right? So if I don't believe in the product, if I don't think it's something that's genuine in terms of its freshness or where the uh, actual root of the product and things like that. We don't want to have it because at the end of the day, it's going from our store and we don't want to let anybody down, right? Uh, so one of the things that we uh, try on is the fact that we have been trusted by every single one of our customers. They're, it's not like them going into um, a grocery store, walking into Kiehl's and picking their own uh, oranges or apples or whatever vegetables that they want. Because at that point, they have the opportunity to look at it, look at the size, the quality, if there's any uh, damages or anything at all, and then they pick what they want. But here, they trust us to do that for them. So we have to make sure that it's 100% when we give it to them. Uh, so right now, I am blessed with a team of staff who understand exactly what we want and the vision that we have. Uh, now it's come to a point where I need to kind of pull them back a little bit because they go a bit extra with the, the type of uh, quality check they do. For an example, the, the, there's somebody who delivers uh, fresh fruits and stuff. And uh, I get a call from this lady saying, I don't think I can uh, give you guys oranges anymore. I was like, why is that? And then she says, because you know, uh, the girl at your store keeps putting them aside, even if there's a little dot on it. And I, and I said, okay, let me ask her. And I call this girl and I ask her, I said, can you show me the pictures of these fruits that you put aside? She shows me a little dot. I said, why, why do you put that away? And she says, because that little dot is going to grow into something slightly bigger in another day. And the next day after that, and... Eventually, if there's a complaint for that, I'm responsible. So I was like, okay, I understand. But so that's the type of uh, detail because we are not going to large volume, large quantities. It's easy for us to do that. So we would like to do that at this point when we can. Maybe later on might be impossible. Uh, it will be a really tough task for us if we have large volume and we have a lot of orders. But at the moment, we can deal with it. And uh, while we can, I think we should do it. So, yeah. Thanks. That answers uh, that question. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you again, Johnny. Uh, there's one more audience related question. This one is, I would like to direct it to Melissa. Uh, the question is, was it accessibility over price during COVID? Um, it was definitely, I would say accessibility over price because like for me, I was also on lockdown and uh, something I noticed was yes, during that time, I did notice things were slightly pricier than they were uh, before. But I also, as a consumer, I understood the difficulty in um, accessing a product and it being made available during a time that was so tough when none of us could go out and just get it ourselves. Um, I didn't mind paying um, a price that was slightly higher. So I would say, yes, it was definitely uh, accessibility over price during this con uh, pandemic. And um, because it was all about just, sorry, That's sorry. Right. It was, uh, I think it was just our survival instincts just kicking in and trying to keep sane, uh, which was the most important thing during that time. So I don't think, uh, yes, so for, 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 I would say for um, during that time, something that we experienced a lot was having to have or and stock up on food for example because we weren't sure when the next curfew was going to hit and um, that was definitely an issue um, because you know you, you we were all spending so much to stock up on food right and something that I was really thinking about was how the daily wage earners were doing that um, in, in terms of stocking up food. So for me, yeah, like we, I guess we are definitely privileged to be able to even um, have the money to stock up during a time like that. Um, 
but uh, when it comes to the base that orders, especially like from cafes and restaurants like us, it was definitely uh, accessibility over price for sure. Thank you, Melissa. Indeed, that would uh, certainly answer the question that was raised. So we've come towards the end of the webinar. We've gone through several questions uh, that have been constructed already, several audience related questions have been answered. So my final question to you is, do you believe, uh, do you believe that there is a bright prospective for the food and beverage industry in Sri Lanka? Any concluding remarks, any final advice that you may like to share with the audience? So this, I would like to open it, open the question up to all panelists. I'd like to start with uh, the looper. Uh, well, if, if, if I'm to say, <coughs> your company or if your brand or if your restaurant was waiting for a sign, <clears throat> probably that would be it. This would be it. So it's about how, how you navigate this change and how you navigate and manage this crisis. It's no fun for sure. But uh, I think as uh, Charles Darwin also said, uh, it is not the strongest or not the most intelligent would survive this crisis, but the one who could uh, technically manage the change properly. So for that, uh, I mean, personally, a big cafe, I would say a chain, it's not a big change though, but with 10 um, restaurants and cafes running, I have to always keep uh, my structure lean, but the team very strong. So that was the that was the only way out that we right now have. So we need to have our overhead structure so lean that we have the flexibility uh, to play with uh, the, the prices. And also we need to look into our supply chains, our value chains. And one thing that I really uh, experienced during the pandemic, uh, during the lockdown was how suppliers changed, like some relationships over five, six years. And all of a sudden, I understand they had issues also, but all of the suppliers became uh, C2C, consumer to consumer. So they start, you know, selling their cakes, they start selling their food. So because, I mean, everybody make hay when the sun shines, you know, and then uh, my cake were not coming, my, my brownies were not coming, and all that was a huge issue. So I, I really like, you know, in terms of barista, what I'm trying to do is to make this brand a public brand, I would say a mass coffee brand, but not bringing down the quality of the coffee. But wherever possible, I'm not, I'm going to keep these margins, which is going out to those uh, suppliers, and I'm trying to make my own food. So we have already developed our central kitchen, and it is running now. So probably I can I can pass that margin to the consumer and make food more affordable and also coffee more affordable, right? So these initiatives were taken. So what I'm trying to say. It's the industry and, and when I, I think I'm the lead, so that's kind of thing that you have to keep the category alive and you need to drive the category. So I think all the cafes, all the coffee people who are selling, our main problem, our main uh, priority should be to keep the coffee alive. Like, you know, whatever things happens to you, you should have your co coffee beside you. So ma making it more affordable, making it more accessible, secondly, <laughs> With all these uh, online partners, <laughs> all right, you have one. Brilliant. <laughs> I prefer it to be a uh, barista. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that kind of, uh, you know, critical questions to be asked, critical investments to be done. And as I earlier said, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about if you can't uh, fly, you have to run. If you can't run, then you walk. If you can't walk, then you crawl. If you can't you know, but whatever you need to do is to move forward, right? So as a nation, we can't come back and say, okay, look here, this has happened, now what to do, right? We, we all like, you know, all the panel members are responsible and they are like, you know, saving uh, livelihoods of so many people, right? Mm -hmm. So that we, we can't say as leaders, the, the battle that we can't, you know, stop and go back. So which, which is, we are all in. Um, so I, I think it's, it's more, it's, it's very strategic, I would say. It's, it's not a day-to-day -day game uh, that we need to plan. I think as a nation, we need to be very strategic. As a nation, we need to think how the consumer would behave and how, how the, now for an example, my mom, 
right? And uh, she had a smartphone that she only used for Pygmy and all the other things that she had that the normal button phone that she gets a call. And that, that is a pick me phone, right? So now that pick me phone was used to order shopping, uh, like, you know, normal, you know, shopping items, right? Her, her, her food and her beverages. So likewise, the technology will, you know, push people. And at that right point, your company has to be there. So if you don't do those, then I don't think the future is great. I, I don't think tourism, I mean, this is my personal view, I don't think tourism will be back where it was in 2018, December, or maybe 2018, March, to another probably two to three years, right? Um, and that will have a big impact on, on, on the tourism industry. But at the same time, how you can, as you said, uh, like to promote local to come and help it out. Right, so for that, uh, I think the company should be uh, ready. Uh, so that, that that that's the name of the game. That's the name of the game. Thank, thank you, Dilupa, for sharing that visionary uh, perspective. Uh, next, I would like to take uh, Jude's uh, concluding remarks. Um, so uh, let me just see. I think my camera went off as well. Okay, you can see me. <laughs> Um, I think overall, um, uh, to me, uh, especially to our company, I think COVID has completely uh, changed us around. I think it has given us a new opportunity that we want to focus on. And I'm, I'm happy that, um, you know, uh, Janik uh, offered to help out as well. I'm, I'm definitely going to work with him on, on reaching out to some of the suppliers and, and setting up a, a stronger supply chain management and also trying to work with Celeste as well. Um, I think overall, um, the, the patterns have changed. Um, you know, they, you know I, I think people have now got used to a, a different way of uh, buying products, a different way of using online services. Um, and I think I'm just, I think most of the companies are just trying to adapt uh, to that um, trend. I don't think we're still clear of what the trend is because we still hope that uh, things turn around. Um, and we, we don't know what's going to happen next, whether there's going to be a second wave or whatever it is. I know if there's a second wave, uh, this time around, whatever the trends that we see will stick for a long time. I know that hospitality is something that's completely down. In fact, all the properties that are under us in Australia have been closed uh, for the last couple of months. Um, and I think Sri Lanka as well is, is going through a very hard time. Um, I think the, the, the market that's always going to be there is the grocery market uh, and and i think the food market even though if it goes into food delivery um i really feel that uh, eventually the government will find a way to keep the restaurants open and, and find a way to keep people safe while they eat because i just don't think we can stay again at home for such a long time it's impossible um you know we, we lose our minds i mean i i to be honest i've never been home for more than two days because i was out <laughs> out during covid the entire time Okay, I used to be out from six in the morning to eleven in the night, but I'm I'm sitting here as a food delivery company or grocery delivery company, saying that uh, you know we we want to see the restaurants open. We want to see people going into the restaurants. We want to see people getting food delivered just because they can't go there. Uh, maybe because they're they're just having other plans, but not because they just can't go there. I mean that's that's a that's a, a change that um, I don't think will happen in a, in. A, anytime soon. I think the restaurants will still be open and people will still go enjoy their food in a safe manner. And the delivery companies like ourselves, I mean, we're new, uh, but we're going to try our best to support the restaurants. Everybody on board, uh, you know, with a sustainable cost, uh, faster deliveries, and at the same time um, to ensure that we come up with fantastic promotions that uh, we can give back to the, to the uh, industry, to be honest. And I think a lot of the tech companies like ours, uh, ourselves, we can really do something uh, for the industry in terms of promotions and so on and work with the restaurants. Um, and I know that uh, I went to Bakes by Bella, I think, uh, right after I started my operations. And uh, I remember we, we, we got Bakes by Bella on board and we got some orders coming through from uh, faraway places, I think, uh, Bevel and so on. Uh, but I know that the pattern of now the people who are way beyond Colombo uh, now enjoying Colombo food is going to stay. 
Uh, and I think that's going to be an important pattern, even in grocery delivery. You know, the, the important vegetables, seafood, all of that is now going to people who are outside of Colombo as well. And I remember a lot of people actually called me. I got hundreds and hundreds of calls of people in Gampaha and so on saying, why are you guys not, you know, focusing on us? I mean, what did we do? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I remember saying, trust me, I will get the logistics right. Uh, and when I do that, I will reach out to all of uh, everybody. And I think now we've we've got to that point now. We're going to look after everybody and in all areas and support all sorts of small businesses. And I love the fact that Janik uh, touched on the sustainability. I think, um, you know, we we started with the paper bags because we got uh, some paper bags first. And then as soon as it got sold out, I went to a company called Lalang Plastic and I stood outside their factory until the owner came in for me to buy plastic bags because I had no way to buy bags. Uh, and I really hope that moving forward, the government is going to be more prepared. Uh, I think they need to keep the printing industry open. They need to keep certain industries open. And I think if that's there, then the entire support system is going to be, uh, it's going to be good enough for, you know, companies to come in and actually make a difference uh, and, and, to, and to be sustainable and, and to make sure that we support everybody. Um, so at, at the end of the day, uh, eventually we're going to, you know, we're going to fight COVID together. We fought Spanish flu. We fought so many different uh, um, influenzas. Uh, I feel that uh, at the end of that, uh, you know, eventually life will return back to normal. I really do feel that. I think we'll eventually end up just going to the grocery store and uh, you know, just going out to restaurants. And that's already happening. Uh, but I, I still hope that a bunch of people will <laughs> buy from... Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Without I mean, mask. Without a mask, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know how many, you know, I, I was just telling Janik, I said, Janik, I get through so many masks because I sweat like crazy. You know, uh, my, my my hand gloves, I get through at least 10 hand gloves. I'm not proud of it, but it's because they get torn so quickly that I had to go and get those hardcore hand gloves that they use for, uh, you know, I, I got it from the right. supermarket. That, 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 yeah. So what I started doing is I started hand sanitizing the hand gloves and then start, start using that because that's the only way to be sustainable based on the, what government tells us to do. The only thing we can do is that, uh, you know, we need to kind of uh, sanitize the hand gloves because every time I used to go out there saying I have a hand sanitizer, the cop says, no, I don't care. Just put the, put the hand gloves. It doesn't matter. You have hand sanitizer or you're safe or whatever it is, but you just put the hand gloves, <laughs> otherwise you're not gonna go. So I think uh, those kind of things will be addressed um, you know, next time around. We're just gonna be a lot prepared. And um, I think we're gonna be okay this time around if there's a second wave, I don't know, uh, I hope not, but we're gonna be okay. Uh, and, and we're gonna support, Eat Me Global is gonna support everybody out there as much as possible. We're gonna get all the fresh produce and Janik, I'm definitely gonna speak to you about uh, sustainability, number one. Uh, <laughs> number two, uh, getting out to as many suppliers as possible. And uh, I, I know that uh, we already work with Dilupa and, and Melissa. I know I've not worked with Ronali. Um, you know, we're going to try and uh, work with as many people as possible to get everybody on our platform and support uh, the general public and the industry uh, as a whole. Thank you, Jude. Indeed, uh, positive and hopeful comments. I'd like to uh, see Kronali's concluding remarks next. Um, so I think that adaptability is the name of the game right now. Um, I mean, if you compare all the previous pandemics, this one is actually not bad at all compared to all the other pandemics where like a quarter of the population died um, and 80% of cases recover from it. So I also feel people are kind of overreacting. Um, so I feel as time goes by, things will return to normal. And it's just, I mean, I'm different to all um, my other panelists because I'm a home-based business and I operate totally online. Um, so in that way, other than the two months of lockdown where I had no revenue, um, other than that period, it hasn't really changed um, my business much. Um, but I feel like during this, these uncertain times, everyone has to just be adaptable and focus on making some revenue, you know, just generating revenue and things will be back to normal. I'm so sure within, by the end of the year, everything's going to go back to normal. Once people realize that 
you know the media is kind of blowing things a little bit out of proportion um and they just take personal precautions themselves and wash their hands and practice social distancing um i i strongly feel that the food and beverage sector is definitely going to boom after this so it's only a matter of time before it comes to that point and just being adaptable in the meantime thank you ronali optimistic remarks indeed uh, melissa if i may seek your um yeah so i obviously i agree with uh, all the ending remarks that you guys have given so far and uh, uh, to just continue on what with on what uh, ronali mentioned about adaptability it is the most important thing at the moment and us being human beings uh, we have been adapting and evolving since the dawn of time so we're just going to adapt and evolve through this as well and um something that i've always been a firm believer of is th- that through adversity always comes opportunity and um as such i believe tough times don't last tough to pit tough people do and um with people like me who actually put literally everything i have into this business uh failure is not an option as such i will keep pushing forth and i have to say um i've had immense support from people like eat me global jude i have to say working with you guys has been an absolute pleasure um i haven't had similar experiences with other delivery giants such as uber eats and pick me food unfortunately um hopefully they will get better but i have to say working with you has been an absolute pleasure so thank you i'm glad you guys <laughs> came on board with us yeah thank you melissa we will get through this yeah definitely thank you hopeful remarks indeed last but not least janik <laughs> Okay, so I'm not going to talk about adaptability anymore because everybody, that's that's pretty much the key thing, right? So, yeah. So apart from that, the only thing that I'd like to say is that it's definitely going to get better. Uh, we just need to get together. Everyone needs to help each other, and I'm definitely honored to be a part of this panel because everybody on this has done quite a lot uh, in terms of their part, and they have quite a lot that they've achieved. And uh, Celeste is just a startup. We haven't really been around for too long, and for me, being in this panel means a lot. To be amongst people like uh, Bella, Melissa, <laughs> and Ronali, all of you, because you all of you have achieved quite a lot in each of your areas that you have uh, got into. Um, but one thing that I strongly believe in is that right now is not a time for us to be trying to make a lot of money and really try to increase our profits. It's about trying to survive. it's about trying to have some revenue enough for us to keep staying afloat and the most important thing is maintaining the trust that we have with our customers and also our staff right because for us the first thing that i was really disappointed to see that a lot of big companies in sri lanka and around the world did was uh, laying people off sending them home right uh, and for us as as entrepreneurs as company owners managers or whatever position that you have um you have made enough money in the past that you have some profits that you made in the past and in worst case scenario if you have to go for a year or 6 months without making a profit uh, you might have to pull into a bit of your uh, savings you might have to get an overdraft or things like that but the staff that you're sending home have absolutely no option if you send them home these are people who will not be able to have access to any type of revenue they will uh, some of them are lucky enough to have a little bit of a vegetable plot or something in their houses but apart from that you see most of these people going and uh, pawning their jewelry losing their motorbike or their three wheelers and the basic stuff that they had right so i think the most important thing is for us to remember that uh, if you are if you take care of your staff right now if all of us stay together and take care of the staff that we have they will also be loyal and they will never forget and even if they get a job in one of the best companies established companies they will remember that right now some of the big names didn't really care they sent their people home but the smaller companies uh retained everybody and now they will start trusting you more than those places the big names that they would want to go to because they know that when push came to shove and things got really difficult you didn't let them go you took care of them right so that is something that i think we need to be in the human side and at the end of the day whatever happens that's going to give 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 back to you at some point 
for us, that's one decision we took the moment this happened uh, with Celeste. Straight away, we decided, okay, even if we have to call this entire year off and say, okay, it was a loss for us, we are not going to send any of our staff home um, because that we can do to somehow survive, but these people will have absolutely nothing if they go home. Uh, I had a chat with Melissa uh, last week about trying to uh, work, work on something together, and she told me the same thing. And I was really happy to hear that where she didn't let any of her staff go. She kept everybody and she did the same thing. And I think all of us should take pride in being able to do that because you are leading them and you are right in front and they look up to you. And if you let them down by sending them home, uh, even if you send two or three people home and the others stay, all of them have that uh, negativity within them and they'll be like, okay, tomorrow might be my day that I'll be sent home. So um, I think all of us need to help each other and also get out of this situation and more than anything else uh, maintain the trust that we have with our customers and our staff so uh, i don't think it's going to take too long for us to come out of all of us adapt and all of us are able to um, live with these things and it becomes a norm after a while whether you have to wear your mask and whatever we do is just going to we have to adapt and it's going to uh, get better in the next few months so god willing all of us are going to get out of this so Thank you very much for having me on this uh, panel. And I am truly honored, especially to be amongst all of you guys. Thanks, Tadushka. Thanks. Thanks, Janik. Indeed, a pleasure to have you on board. Uh, very strong sentiments from a humanitarian perspective that you shared. So that's a wrap that concludes uh, our webinar. I'm extremely thankful to the panelists for allocating time. I think it was almost a two hour long webinar where you shared yeah, a, lot it <laughs> <laughs> a lot of valuable insight on recipe for change. So on behalf of Chocolate, I would like to thank you again and all the very best in the future endeavors that you undertake. I'm Chatush Kadiavis signing off on behalf of Chocolate. Have a great rest of the evening. See you. Bye guys. Take Bye. care everyone. Bye. 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 See you.